A big thanks go to KiwiCo for sponsoring today's video. If you've seen any of the Apollo launch videos or even the new Artemis launch videos, you will no doubt be familiar with the shot of the massive F1 engines on the launch of the Saturn V or the four RS-25 engines and boosters on the SLS rocket as they leave the mobile launch pad. Now compare that to the SpaceX Starship and the super heavy booster with its 33 Raptor engines at takeoff. And you may be wondering why they need 33 smaller engines when the Saturn and SLS only had four or five respectively, plus a couple of boosters. Now, yes, there is a difference in the thrust. The SpaceX Starship with its super heavy booster generates twice as much thrust as the Saturn V did. But the end goal of the new Artemis mission is the same, whether they're using the Starship or the NASA SLS, and that is to take a lander with a human crew and place it onto the moon's surface and then bring them home again. The Apollo program did that six times in the 1960s and 70s. In fact, back then, the Apollo program and later Skylab program launched 13 Saturn Vs, which included Apollo 4, 5, and 6, the unmanned test flights, and used a total of 65 Rocketdyne F1 engines with a 100% success rate, although all of them ended up in the Atlantic because they were designed to be used once and then discarded. Compare this to the SpaceX Starship and the Super Heavy Booster, both of which in time should be fully reusable in a similar way to the SpaceX Falcon 9 and the Falcon Heavy. And this is where the two rocket systems diverge into separate paths. The Saturn V was the first and so far only rocket to take men beyond low Earth orbit, but the Saturn V just didn't come out of nowhere. It was a development from the Jupiter rocket family, a research and development vehicle which was in turn part of the Redstone rocket family, which was in turn an intermediate range ballistic missile in the 1950s, even though it was being used for space research, just like the Soviet R 7 ICBM, which launched Sputnik into orbit. The US Army Ballistic Missile Agency designed the Jupiter under the direction of Werner von Braun, who during the Second World War was the lead scientist and developer of the German V-2 rocket. As part of Operation Paperclip, von Braun, 1500 scientists and a number of unused V-2s had been brought over from Germany to America after World War II to help develop the US rocket technology but they were closely controlled on what they could and couldn't do. That changed in 1957 when the Soviets launched Sputnik 1 on top of an R-7 ICBM. This really put the wind up the Americans because if the Soviets could launch a satellite into orbit, then they could place a nuclear weapon anywhere in the US. From then on, Von Braun was put in charge of creating a new heavy rocket which he would base on the Jupiter. In fact, he referred to the Jupiter as an infant Saturn, and a Jupiter C rocket was used to launch the first American satellite, Explorer 1, into orbit in 1958, to match what the Soviets had done with Sputnik the year before. From 1959 to 1962, the Marshall Space Center, under the direction of Von Braun, designed a series of Saturn rockets. The first three-stage version was the Saturn C3. This would be a three-stage vehicle that could lift 45,000 kilos into low Earth orbit and send 18,000 kilos to the moon via translunar injection. The design started with two F1 engines for the first stage, but by 1961 this had been increased to three, as it was figured it might take two or three launches to get a single landing on the moon. So a bigger rocket was planned that could lift a heavier payload. This would be the Saturn C4, which would use four F1 engines and would only need to carry out two launches for each moon landing. But why not do it with just one launch rocket and save the cost of having two launches and two rockets? So the C5 was planned. This would use five F1 engines for the first stage, five J2 engines for the second stage, and a single J2 engine for the third stage and would be the design which would go on to take men to the moon for all the Apollo missions. As we are talking about rocket engineering, it might be worth pointing out that understanding about rockets, engines, and how they work, and the scientific and technical things, is what I love doing on this channel. 
My journey to where I am today started in 1975 when I was 13 after I saw a friend get an electronics kit for Christmas. That fascinated me so much that I wanted my own. So I sold my beloved train set and bought my own electronics kit and managed to find some pictures of the same one I had back in 1975. That kickstarted me into electronics and then computing and then my own electronic repair business, then computer business, then into a video production business and then onto YouTube where I've been for the last eight years. And it all started with that electronics kit. So getting a set of KiwiCo crates to show my 10 year old daughter how things work and can be put together by herself with my help is something which really resonated with me and my learning experience. KiwiCo is all about learning how to make things like STEM subjects fun and interesting. We got a light up planetarium which projects the stars and constellations onto a ceiling or a wall in a darkened room so you can learn what they look like and where they are from the comfort of your home when you can't go outside. Everything is included in the crate so there's nothing extra to find and all the projects are fun and teach skills in things like assembly, electrical and mechanical know-how and how to go from a kit of flat parts to a fully functional 3D product. The crates are designed by experts to be fun and easy to put together and are available for a range of ages from newborns up to us adults so you don't need to feel left out when the kids are having all the fun. You can buy just single crates to find out what they're like or subscribe to a monthly delivery once you're ready. To help support the channel, act now and you can get 50% off of your first crate of a monthly KiwiCo subscription when you go to kiwico.com forward slash Curious Droid and use the code Curious Droid. But as time went by and more testing was done, a problem was revealed with the F1. The F1 engine had been developed to replace the E1 engine, which was created to meet the 1955 US Air Force requirement for a very large rocket engine. While the E1 worked, it was seen as a bit of a technological dead end, and the F1 was its even larger replacement. Back in the mid 50s, there was the ethos of making everything as large as possible. The biggest planes, the biggest buildings, the biggest bombs, the biggest cars, and so it went with rocket engines. But at the time, there was no rocket that could use such a large engine, so the development halted. However, when NASA was created, it could see there might be an application for a very large engine and contracted Rocketdyne to complete its development. However, early on, tests showed that a serious combustion instability could sometimes lead to a catastrophic failure. This was caused by oscillations around 4 kHz with harmonics up to 24 kHz in the combustion chamber and they could be so strong that they could cause the combustion chamber to fail. But they were also very intermittent and varied in strength. This was something which had been seen in smaller engines but with the very large size of the F1 it became a very big issue. The problem was so serious it took almost two years to find a solution and threatened to end the Apollo program if it couldn't be fixed. The solution was found by detonating small explosive charges of black powder in a tube whilst the engine was running. This would show how the powerful oscillations were moving through the chamber and possibly how to stop them. In the end, after many, many design iterations created through trial and error, baffles were used on the injector plates to dampen the oscillations. This became so successful that the engine was stable enough that it would self-damp any artificially induced instability within a tenth of a second and produced a very reliable engine. Meanwhile, in the Soviet Union, engineers had also come across the same instability in larger rocket designs. Their solution was to split the engine up into a single turbo pump which fed multiple smaller combustion chambers, usually four. If you look at the RD-107 engines used on the R-7 rocket, which launched Sputnik and many others later, you will see four boosters strapped to the base of the rocket, each with four nozzles. But in fact, each of these is just one engine with four separate combustion chambers and four nozzles. And this is how the Soviets got around the instability issue. They would later use the same idea of many smaller engines for their version of the moon rocket, which would become more powerful than the Saturn V and would be known as the N1. 
This design called for 30 smaller rocket engines, but they were more efficient than the F1 engines with a specific impulse of 331 seconds compared to 263 of the F1. They also used a different way of steering the rocket compared to the Saturn V. On the Saturn V, the four outer engines used hydraulically powered gimbals to move the engines and steer the rocket on takeoff. The N1 rocket used a method called differential thrust. Here, all the engines were fixed in place and they would increase or decrease the thrust on one side of a rocket compared to the other to steer it. The problem here was they had to rely upon an early control computer called Cord to keep the thrust balance correct. If one engine on the left hand side failed, its counterpart on the right hand side would have to be shut down to maintain the thrust balance. This meant that if you had two or more engine failures, you would have to shut down four, six or eight engines instead of just two, three or four. One of the main reasons why the design used so many smaller engines meant that should you lose one or two, the launch would not be compromised. If the same were to happen to a Saturn V and one of the five F1 engines were lost, it would lose 20% of its thrust straight away and would probably mean the mission might have to be aborted as it might not have the thrust required to make it to the correct orbit unless it was very late on and near the shutdown of the first stage anyway. However, due to budget restraints and the lack of test facilities for such a very large rocket as the M1, only about one in six engines was actually tested. The rest were taken straight from the factory floor and fitted to the rocket. The flight itself would be the test, very much like the SpaceX and their move fast and break things methodology. The first four launches of the M1 all failed. Some failed due to fuel plumbing failures caused by an engine shutdown and others by the engines themselves failing, but both caused a cascade failure and the loss of the entire rocket. The untimely death of Sergei Korelyov in 1966, the lead engineer and scientist who unbeknownst to the US was literally the man in control of everything to do with the M1 was also a big shock to the Soviet moon program. This left his deputy, Vasily Mishin, in charge, but he lacked Korelyov's political astuteness of the Soviet system and the influence, and it was also reputed that he was a bit of a heavy drinker. By 1972, and already having lost the race to the moon to the Americans, with the failure of the fourth M1 rocket, the Soviet Communist Party lost patience with the N1 program and cancelled it. Now some 50 years later, SpaceX is using a similar type of design for the Starship Heavy Booster, which uses 33 Raptor engines. Now, this is nothing new. The Falcon 9 uses nine Merlin engines, and the Falcon Heavy uses three boosters, each with nine engines, so 27 engines in total. And these have become the most reliable launch systems in history. But there is another reason why they use so many smaller engines instead of just a few larger ones and that is reusability. The Saturn V with its F1 engines was created at a time when reusability was not seen as an option. It wasn't as if they couldn't be used. They could have been, and they were rated for 10 reflights. The problem was getting them back in one piece. In the 1970s, Rocketdyne did studies into a version of the F1 which included a reusable flyback Saturn S1C first stage but that didn't get any further than the drawing board. Now we live in a world where the old way of spaceflight is seen as wasteful because very little, if anything, of the rockets and spacecraft was reused. Elon Musk, CEO of SpaceX, has said that you wouldn't buy a car and use it for just one journey and then throw it away, so why would you do the same with a rocket? One of the main features of SpaceX rocket designs was to make them reusable like the Falcon 9 which can land back at the launch pad or another landing zone after it has developed its payload to orbit. And this is why the Super Heavy booster needs so many smaller engines. Firstly, to get the huge amount of thrust at takeoff, twice that of the Saturn. But when it comes to landing the now virtually empty booster back on Earth, it requires much less thrust than it did to take off in the first place. If we look at a super heavy booster, its weight at launch is 3,600 metric tons. 3,400 of those is fuel, 
leaving just 200 tonnes for the dry weight of the booster, plus some fuel for landing. So the thrust required to slow it down to landing speed is not that much in comparison to when it took off. If the Super Heavy had, say, five F1 equivalent engines with 700 metric tonnes of thrust, then just one engine would be too powerful for it to land, as the F1 engines were unable to be throttled down in power. Even if the engines had a throttle control, it would have to go down to under 40%, which only the most modern engines that have been designed with that in mind can do. During the final landing of the Super Heavy booster, 13 engines are used to slow it from high altitude and about 1200 km per hour, which then reduce down to three when it comes closer to the ground as the speed drops to under 10 km per hour for its final landing. Having the ability to use many engines to slow the descent and then switch to just three and use their throttle control and gimbling to guide the booster down allows it to be landed and then reused. Big engines are also more expensive to manufacture. The F1 engines were effectively handmade with thousands of welds holding them together. Today, with new manufacturing techniques, the number of parts required can be 80 to 90% less, with a production of Raptor engines running at around about one per day. And when mass production levels are reached, the cost of Raptor engines is expected to be under $250,000 a piece. The Rocketdyne F1 engines were a simple design and relatively cheap to produce considering how labor intensive they were to build. They had an estimated cost equivalent to $15 million in today's money, assuming that 40 were purchased at a time and 10 to 12 per year were manufactured. In all, 98 were produced and delivered to NASA in total. Although each F1 was only going to be used once for the launch and then ditched in the Atlantic afterwards, it was rated for 10 reflights. In testing, two engines were used, one performing 20 tests for a total of 2,256 seconds and the other for 34 tests and 2,913 seconds. During the actual flights, they were only used between 159 and 165 seconds. If they could have been returned to Earth safely, then they could have been reused many more times. In all, SpaceX's model of using many engines not only gives it the thrust it requires at takeoff, but also the control for landing either the booster or the Starship back to Earth on another planet or moon if required. It's also a little ironic that the NASA SLS rockets are using the RS-25 engines from the Space Shuttle, which the designers went to great lengths to make reusable and are now being used for one-way journeys before being dropped into the Atlantic in the same way as their F-1 predecessors. And now the reusable part of the SLS rocket is the solid rocket boosters, same as in the shuttle days, which are far simpler in their construction. So you're saving the simple stuff and throwing away the complicated expensive bits. Maybe the best brains in NASA have already left and are working for SpaceX because it's beginning to look that way. So thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did then please thumbs up, share and subscribe and a big thank you goes to all our patrons for their ongoing support.